Hey folks, Joe Bon Giovanni here again, Cattle Pond Institute for Debt Free Money. Debt Free Money being the solution to the problems that we're going to talk about today. And as I had said in my introduction, this is uh, my take on uh, a talk that I might have given at the uh, American Monetary Institute's conference uh, titled Fixing the Broken Money System. Fixing our broken money system. Very important distinction. Whose money system is it anyway? Um, so I'm going to uh, try to address, you know, fixing the broken money system and how debt-based money causes wealth concentration. And uh, de wealth concentration, um, I'm afraid it's, a, it's, a, it's just become just a little bit more than, you know, than the weather. Uh, that is to say that everybody talks about it, nobody seems to know uh, what's causing it, what really causes it, and uh, very few people have solutions. I was very fortunate to be able to attend um, the Levy Institute Ford Foundation's uh, annual Minsky Conference back in April at the Ford Foundation in Manhattan. And uh, at that conference, <coughs> excuse me, over the course of the three days of the conference, there were four separate panels involving nine speakers and two speakers individuals who spoke in terms of their uh, including one from the Fed by the way <coughs> which was um, uh, Sarah Bloom Raskin who's a Fed governor and who I think we're going to hear a lot about but but my, my main point was that uh, she was also what's the subject the subject is inequality um, uh, you know, having that many speakers over a three-day period with the, and that many panels over that three-day period, with the subject being inequality, being the way economists describe uh, the results of uh, income uh, uh, distortions and wealth concentrations uh, that have become, well, they are egregious, you know, to our social order, uh, is what they really are. Uh, so much so that, you know, that was kind of the theme of the, whole, of the whole conference. So the esteemed gathering at the uh, Ford Foundation with the Levy Economics Institute, um, everybody's talking about wealth concentration. But not one person talked about it causally, and not one person talked about solving the problem of wealth concentration. So how big of a problem is it? The only thing I can tell you is that since the Levy Institute's uh, conference, uh, back in April, the situation has either only gotten worse or the reporting on it has gotten better uh, in the sense that, uh, in the sense that, um, uh, you know, the, the, the record profits of the uh, large uh, bank corporations uh, are reported in for the first quarter. <coughs> Excuse me. Sorry for my, uh, my allergy. But, um, uh, but but still, very few people are talking about why it is the way that it is. So that's what I wanted to talk about. You know, not how finally, finally, we are measuring the results of tons of research. Okay, with regard to wealth inequality, uh, and income inequality, large portions of the research being funded by those that are causing the same wealth and income inequality through their grants and uh, support of uh, public education and higher public education institutions. Um, but I want to talk about it within the context of one thing that should be kind of painfully obvious <clears throat> to anybody who would take a minute to think about the fact that our debt, we have a debt-based system of money is one of the causes of the um, of the uh, wealth concentration, honest to goodness crisis. Okay, now <clears throat> having said that, what I would like to do is to is to just uh, talk a little bit about <clears throat> about uh, the, the, the my overall presentation here. <clears throat> Debt based money issuance. What does that involve? Well, basically, what it involves is the fact that you get access to money these days by being creditworthy. Okay, you have a debt-based money issuance. We only issue money when we issue debt, and we only issue that debt-based money to the creditworthy. Okay, 
<clears throat> uh, you can kind of say the gist of it is that whoever needs it the most gets it last and pays the most for it. I'm going to talk about um, one of the people who I think has best laid out exactly how the system of debt-based money concentrates wealth, Dr. Bernard Senf. He's Professor Emeritus at the Berlin School of Economics. Um, <coughs> and he shows in his analysis, in his first English language um, lecture that he's done um, uh, on the subject of money, uh, how there is a systemic gravitation okay, to the 1%. And now there should be some question as to whether that's true. And I definitely agree there should be. And uh, after the discussion is had, you will see that it is true. And then once it is true, what are we going to do about it? And I want to contrast that debt-based system of money and the result being wealth concentration with my, I guess I'm going to call him, you know, kind of my guru of money which is Dr. Frederick Soddy. Dr. Frederick Soddy wrote a book, wrote many books, wrote many books, being a, 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 a Nobel Prize winner, but and not as a, not in econ economics. But he wrote a book called The Role of Money. And when you get digesting the entire subject matter of the role of money, what it comes down to is that the role of money is to distribute wealth. That is the role of money in an economic democracy is to distribute the wealth that is created by labor and energy. Well, that's labor, energy, resources, that's what makes wealth, and the distribution of the wealth that's being created is the role of money in, a, in an, an economic democracy. So, <coughs> excuse me, we have distribution of wealth versus concentration of wealth, and we need to have an equitable distribution of our national wealth. And then to, to finally to say that the separation of money issuance from banking is the entire story of how to get over to the side of the equitable distribution of money. <coughs> Excuse me. Money being issued through government pay, pay, payments for services. That's how all new money would come into existence. Of course, we're going to have to straighten out the monetary system being what it is. Now, one of the things that I was going to talk about is the staggering thought of Robert J. Hempel, who was an Atlanta Federal Reserve Bank economist in, 19, in the 1930s. And he made this staggering thought commentary, which to me is, the, is, is pretty much wraps up the entire problem of having a debt-based system of money. And it relates very well to the situation that we have today with regard to austerity being the solution when we have too much debt, okay? This is, I'm going to quote uh, um, uh, Robert Hempel's uh, statement here. If all the bank loans were paid, no one could have a bank deposit, and there would not be a dollar of coin or currency in circulation. This is a staggering thought. We are completely dependent on the commercial banks. Someone has to borrow every dollar we have in circulation, cash or credit. <coughs> if the banks create ample synthetic money, we are prosperous. If not, we starve. We are absolutely without a permanent money system. This is the most important subject intelligent persons can investigate and reflect upon. Now, so said, so said Dr. Hempel, uh, uh, Robert Hempel, again, the econ chief economist, the credit officer of the Atlanta Fed, whose role is to determine, you know, the creditworthiness basically of the banks. <coughs> so we're, I'm going to talk now about the debt-based money issuance system. It is what I call a systemic unleveling of the playing field on which the national economy is played out. Debt-based money issuance is a systemic unleveling of the playing field. It contributes to the playing field being tilted 
in favor of those who issue the money. The prosperity that every person, you know, in terms of their comfort and their and their happiness, uh, seeks is only available to the most creditworthy. And what's happening today is a is a shrinking of the base, the shrinking of the, the lower mod, lower moderate income to the middle income, up to the highest income. Okay? So prosperity goes to the fewer and fewer and fewer, and where it comes from is from the many and the many and the many, and the 99% are in the 1%. So again, whoever gets, whoever needs the, needs it the most, now that would be credit now we're talking about. Whoever needs it most gets it last. And they pay the most to use it when they do get it. <coughs> so that, I want to just talk for a minute here now about how the debt money system concentrates wealth. And I'm going to give my two cents worth on it, but I really want to refer everybody to take the time to inform yourselves about the work of Dr. Bernard Zempf, again, Professor Emeritus of the Berlin School. Now, of course, right here I'm going to throw in a copy of my slide, which has the... Um, Blip TV uh, file number for Dr. Dr. Senf's uh, English language lecture, which is 4111596. Um, and the title of his lecture was The Deeper Roots of the World Financial Crisis. <clears throat> and I'm going to give you my two cents on it, okay? Now, which is that, which is that in a debt-based monetary system, okay, those who are able to have access to money, when now we say money, we mean credit. And so when we say credit, we say, we say the issuance of the credit by the lender is a function of what? Ability to pay by the borrower. Meaning, the more wealthy the borrower is, the more access that they have to the monetary um, credits okay, that are created with, uh, by issuing debt-based money. So we have a system where all money over time is issued to the wealthier and the wealthier, okay, as a debt. And the fact that it's issued as a debt for the issuer, okay, means that over time there is a return, the highest return, to the issuer of the money. The highest return to the issuer of the money from the first user of the money. That is really the mechanical tool by which wealth gets concentrated. You have wealth, you have access to debt-based money, you can return a higher, uh, make a higher return to the people that are lending it, and for yourself, of course. But the point being that, that there is a natural tendency for the credit to go to the most credit-worthy, being the most wealthy, being those in control of the, themselves of the most monet, monetary assets, and on the other side, okay, a diminishing, a lessening, okay, a pulling back of the availability of credit to those, again, who need it most, okay, to those who can be forced to get it from more expensive me methods, and that's primarily from credit cards. Um, and that is to say that uh, uh, the issuance of the the issuance of the credit card took place against the issuance of the wages, um, the the lack of the issuance of the wages, I should say, and that is what has caused the um, the cost of credit by debt issuance to go higher to the to the least able to afford it, therefore a welling from the people who can least afford it of their interest payments up to the issuers of the of the uh, money and then <clears throat> to the point where the only thing that people that the people that are doing up there, the financial easters, are issuing money to themselves. That is to say, they're creating new forms 
of monetary assets uh, uh, on which to uh, on which to consume through which to consume the credit that's available in, in society and we call that financialization and we have seen how finance itself has grown as a huge to a huge share uh, of the uh, of the of the economy and what happens there you know it the part that doesn't go into into uh, investment in production and the creation of wages and jobs that part that doesn't happen and therefore the wages contributing to the ability of those people to uh, to consume uh, the, their needs gets reversed you know, they don't get the money that they need to consume their needs that's how they formed the 99 percent that's how the 90 became the 92 and the 94 and the 95 and the 99 is because the wages didn't go to the wage earning part of the population rather money was used issuing issuing it as a debt and issuing it to the most credit worthy with the highest rate of return and that mechanical uh, mechanical aspect of uh, of the money issuing system is what causes wealth to be concentrated in the highest now one of the things that I want to point out is that uh, is that when a lot of people learn about the fact of wealth concentration let's say income disparity and wealth concentration there's a lack of income okay and because there's a lack of income there's a lack of wealth accumulation and when people learn about that they tend to say well what we need to do is to tax the money back we need to tax the money back they've earned it you could say surreptitiously I would say immorally and in a kind of a corrupted kind of a kind of a manner in terms of our monetary system but they've they've done that and now they have the wealth and what we really need to do is to tax it back now this is what I want to say about that yeah you can do that and you can do that either you know you can do that either by itself and think that that's going to solve the problem or you can do it with in conjunction with another important action and rather then taxing back the money from the people who control it to taking back the system of money to taking back the monetary system and that's what needs to happen because if you just take back the money through taxation I can only guarantee you that the corruption that is available to the people that issue the money is going to ensure that whatever regulation you put in place is going to be deregulated and the grandkids are going to be here doing all this all over again so the fact of the matter is that once you recognize that there is a systemic cause to wealth concentration and the real truth behind the systemic cause to the wealth concentration is the debt-based issuance of money that that is the highest systemic cause there are others of course but that's the highest one that's the quintessential one that's the one by which the aristocracy you know maintains itself um, that's why Mr. Rothschild made that statement. Permit me to issue the nation's money, and I care not who makes its laws. You can't just take back the money. You have to take back the money system. <coughs> In his lecture, uh, Dr. Senf identifies the crises that are caused by debt-based money. And again, you have to, you really, you really should, you know, see uh, Dr. Sen's, Sen's presentation. Again, it's his only English language presentation. It's actually two years old now. It's, it'll be three years old <clears throat> soon. So we say, what are the crises that are caused? Well, there's first of all the economic crisis, okay? The economic crisis really is what we're looking at today, you know, unemployment being high. Uh, resources laying idle um, you know you know those are the, the, the in the terms of the macro economy you know those are the kind of things that, that happen but in terms of socially in terms socially with relate to the economy the fact is that unemployment is not it's just not just a statistic it means that people have no jobs it's, it means that people have no money it means that people have no benefits because in this country especially your benefits go with your job and as a result, people have no hope. And that has a tremendous social impact, uh, a, a tremendous impact on society 
that uh, is a crisis. It's a real crisis. Then there's the environmental crisis. Well, basically, uh, basically, the environmental crisis really boils down to this: sustainability, which we have to, which we have to eventually bring into our re use of resources. Okay, natural resources, environmental, environmental resources. <coughs> Excuse me. Is unaffordable. It's unaffordable. You want to go to Congress and you want to try to get a law passed to protect, you know, the environment from, uh, you know, from the from from whatever from fossil fuel, you know, combustion gases and stuff like that. Uh, I'm sorry, you know, that we would like to do that, but we can't afford to. Okay, and the reason that we can't afford to is that it's not profitable. The monetary system is not here to distribute the wealth. The monetary system is here to concentrate the wealth. And if you're proposing something that is going to go against that, then it's not it's not affordable. Then there's the crises at the states, okay? And quite frankly, this is one of the worst, uh, worst, most damaging to our society, because the states cannot meet their budgets. The states gave up their money creation powers. They can only get they can only rely on the money issuance powers of the federal government. The federal government has given over the money issuance powers to the private banks, who are using the debt-based system to concentrate the wealth of. I don't want to just say just the private bankers, because some of my best friends are bankers, but to the the cadre of society that are that are operating that you know that financial sector. So we have no budgets there. Uh, we lose our services. We lose our police services. Lose our fire services. Our fire services are going to get to be user uh, feed. You know, no. If you paid your feed, well, don't call us if you have a fire. You know, or no ambulance service. You know, no whatever. Excuse me. And so, and so, then we, we, what we lose from that is whatever the state can bring to us in terms of our well-being at that level. We don't. We don't have that. And all of that. All of those other crises. You know result in a human crisis, the crisis of, of humanity, with our depression, our frustration, our inability, quite frankly, to figure out how to get to get from here to where we need to be in terms of the pursuit of happiness. <coughs> Excuse me. So and then and then what I want to do is just just take a minute, I'm just gonna sort of repeat what I said about people need to have an understanding about the fact that there's another way of doing this, okay? That debt-free money is a real way of doing it. And Dr. Frederick Soddy, who wrote The Role of Money, and again, amongst his many books, uh, his many books, um, talked, talks in that book. And so, so again, yeah, is there homework here? Yeah, the role of money is part of the homework here, okay? And Dr. Senf is part of the homework here. I can only tell you what I've learned, you know, most of what I learned, I learned from my father, but a lot of what I've learned lately is is from the work of, of um, and especially the role of money in Frederick Soddy. My dad said, if you're going to read anybody about money, read Frederick Soddy, because he is the most knowledgeable person with regard to what money really is. So we have to try to find the way to achieve Soddy's proper role for the national system of money. And we can only do that through the recognition that what we have is a national system of money, okay? That we, the people, own the monetary system. We own it. It's ours. It, 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 we can change it in any way that we want, and we need to change it so that we can have an equitable distribution of wealth being the result of the monetary system functioning as it properly should Let's say the proper role of money, so that we get distribution of wealth and not concentration. And so that brings us to again Saudis. This is Saudis thing, you know. Frederick Saudi, you know, his work was picked up by Henry Simons and all of the early Chicago school people who proposed the Chicago plan for reforming the monetary system to um, to FDR to uh, Franklin Roosevelt. Um, as the Chicago Plan for Monetary Reform, a bill was actually introduced in the Congress at that time called the uh, Monetary Control Act of 1934. It was in both the House and the Senate, but it got waylaid. 
and it got waylaid primarily because of the um, what they call the banking reform acts you know the money and banking reform acts where they put in glass steagall where they put in you know various other um, uh, methods and regulations to try to control um, the uh, excesses of the banking industry but what they didn't do was they tried to separate the front bank which is the bank that takes your deposits you know from the back bank you know the bank that does the investments and and uh, you know etc <coughs> by you know through the glass steagall act but they didn't separate money issuance the issuance of the money from the banking credit and debt issuance function of the bank banking credit debt issuance those are all banking functions. Money issuance is a governmental function. Money issuance without issuing debt is the route to achieving Saudi's distribution uh, of, of, of wealth. And we're very fortunate because, um, as the American Monetary Institute um, has uh, brought forward the, their American Monetary Act, on which uh, Kucinich's H.R. 2990 the National Emergency Employment Defense Act uh, was uh, was modeled, and uh, the, the Kucinich bill includes everything that Frederick Soddy, um, Henry Simons, the Chicago School, Irving Fisher, Irving Fisher, the man who Milton Friedman called the greatest monetary economist of the last century. And don't laugh because I mentioned Milton Friedman, because Milton Friedman himself was a supporter of this type of having a sovereign fiat money, money system with issuance by the government. That's hard to believe, him being a free marketer. But being a free marketer, what he recognized was you can't have free markets without the level playing field. You can't have the free markets without the level playing field. Okay? You can't have totally free enterprise without the level playing field. So Milton Friedman believed in it. Okay, Milton Friedman supported this completely. And um, and uh, and his praise for Irving Fisher was because Irving Fisher and his 100% money proposals came out with it. So basically, that's the story. We need to have the, get rid of the systemic cause of wealth concentration. Wealth concentration comes from debt money issuance. Debt money issuance going to the most credit worthy, the most credit worthy being the people that basically issue the money themselves. That's why financialization has become, became, you know, its own great bubble because they issued the money to themselves. Then they created monetary assets that serve as, uh, as assets around which money gets used. And uh, they just kept taking more and more and more and more and more, and more money and more and more profits and more and more wealth and more and more income to the fewer and the fewer and the fewer. That's how it's done. And we need to do something about it. And there is a way to do something about it. And that is in the, with, with getting the Kucinich bill back up on the table so that we, the people, the 99%, can have a money system that works for us. So that's it, folks. That's well, that was going to be my talk. I don't know if um, if I'm going to be able to get this up into a video or or two, but in the meantime, thanks very much for listening. And um, it would have been a lot better uh, on the stage. Thank you.